Amen. Oftentimes in America, we look for people who are strong enough to carry out what the Lord have done. But all the way through the Bible, we find people that had to be weakened so that the Lord could be strong. Everywhere there was an individual who thought they could do it on their own, wound up pretty much in a mess. The nation of Israel was constantly in a cycle. They thought they had become something and thought they'd become someone, and then God would send a prophet to call them to repent. They would not repent. Then he would send uh, nations, pagan nations, to capture them. They would stay in captivity. They would re finally come to their senses and repent, and then God would begin to restore and begin to rebuild, and God would begin to revive. And so today as we look at Ezra chapter 5, we're going to look at all of 5 and part of 6, and so you're going to have to listen very fast because preaching through the Old Testament, you've got to preach through about 14 verses to get one that you can put your hooks in, all right? Not that those other ones are not important, but a lot of times in a narrative, you've got to read it over and over and over again to get uh, the few nuggets out of it. Does that make sense? And so today, as we look at repenting, reviving, and returning to the work, last week we looked at there's been 14 years since they laid the foundation and they began to go back to work. Now it takes them four years to complete the building. So here's the question i got to ask you in way of introduction. Where would you be today if you had repented four years ago of what God called you to repent from? In other words, what, where would you be right now if you had repented six months ago when God convicted you? To repent. Is, is, is anybody listening in the house? You know, I have to ask my own self the question, you know, when God begins to convict me, do I repent immediately or do I try to put it off? Do I begin to make excuses? Do I try to get God to look at somebody else? And so today as we look at these verses, I want us to look at repenting, reviving, and returning back to work because the truth of it is some of you in this room, you have a testimony that you used to be at work. I'm talking about in the kingdom. And our attitudes has caused us to stay, sit on the sideline. It may be because you're waiting on somebody to ask you. Well, let me just say this, all the way through the New Testament, as well as the Old Testament, when God stirred in the people, they didn't have to be begged and asked. And so now we, what we want is we want acknowledgement. We want someone to come and, and say, hey, you know, you're really needed. Well, let me just say this. God's church has been here over 2,000 years, and in, until he comes, it's still going to be here. I'm really not needed, and you're really not needed. It's a privilege to be, in part of the, be, in, be a part of the family and be in on what God is doing. So I'm going to give you five important truths this morning that um, we need to look at, at the lives of these individuals. Amen? Now, after they've laid the foundation, took a 14-year sabbatical, because they got oppressed, they got the, the people got to talking, God raised up two men, Haggai and Zechariah, to prophesy and to cause a stirring on the inside of them that would cause them to go, we need to repent and get back to doing what we know we need to do. If the truth be known, every one of us in this room, there's an area in your life that you know God's put his finger on before you ever walked in this room that you need to get back to where you used to be. You've grown cold, you've grown lazy, lackadaisical, whatever the case may be. So as we look at these five truths, I pray that the Lord Jesus would simply become real to you, become real to me, and allow us to repent, not to go back to work, but to repent so that he can revive us, that we may have a desire to be obedient, to bring honor and glory to him. Y'all ready? Say amen. First point I want you to understand is, that before you can repent and before you can have revival, there must be a word that must be preached. I want you to understand that preaching is what we need. We ultimately need Jesus. Don't you misunderstand what I'm saying. But faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. How will they know unless someone tell them, unless somebody preach to them? 
preaching is the instrument in which God stirs in people, the Spirit of God and the Word of God comes together and the dunamis explodes and causes us to repent and turn from who we are because until that happens, all you'll do is feel guilty. All you'll do is be ashamed. All you'll do is feel bad about some things and you will never have a transformation. It's not about life change. It's about a life exchange. Jesus didn't come to change your life. He came to exchange you. It's no longer you who live, but Christ that lives in you. The, listen, the Christian life can only be lived by Jesus Christ. The only one that can please the Father is Jesus Christ. That's the reason in Isaiah 53 it says that it pleased the Father to crush him. Do you understand there's not one life in this room that can ever please the Father? But yet it pleased the Father because only Jesus and his life being crushed can please the Father. Amen. Not your religious activity. Let's look at what it says in verse 1, Ezra chapter 5. It says, then the prophet Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Iddo, prophets prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. You find the audience that they deal with. They didn't go and preach to the oppressors. They didn't go preach to the pagans. They went and preached to God's folks. Their audience was the Jews who were in Jerusalem and Judah. Then you not only find the audience, you find the authority. They preached in the name of the Lord they're God. You're going to find in chapter 6 in just a few moments what they said. He's the God of heaven and earth. Then they come to their address, and we looked at their address last week. What is their address? Well, Haggai says, consider your ways. You remember? Is it, is it okay for you to live in paneled houses and my house, the God's house, still be in shambles? Is it okay for you to keep going back to your comfort of life and go back and you know, even though the oppressors are still talking and accusations are being slung all over the place, is it okay for you to keep spending all this time for you and yourself? He said, consider your ways. Zechariah says, return to me. Zechariah says, repent. Two months after Haggai began to preach, Zechariah stood up and goes, look, he called you to consider your ways. Now repent from those ways. You've got a bag with holes in it. You, you, you're planning for much, but you get few. God calls the drought. Go and read it. That's the reason we looked at it last week. So as you look at the practice or the preaching that they heard, they preached in the name of the Lord their God. And if listen to me, if we're going to repent, if we're going to lead, we must lead by example. Vance Habner says this. Here's what Vance Habner says. Put it up there. Let us never be, let, let, it ne, let it never be forgotten that although we may do nothing about the word we hear, listen, as you hear me preach today, and you may do absolutely nothing with it. Don't you hear what he says? The word will do something to us. The same sun, I don't know what that means, that melts ice, <laughs> Hardens the clay. That's what it's supposed to say. Not mess in time. <laughs> the same sun that melts ice and hardens the clay and the word of God humbles, watch this, and the word of God will humble or harden the human heart. See, when you hear the word of God, it does one of two things. It either humble you or harden your heart. When God begins to convict you, what, what will happen is you'll either, either drive you to your knees or you'll get mad and go, you know what, I'm going to just put it off. And six years ago, six months ago, six weeks ago, God convicted you and you refused to repent. And now you become callous to it. The same sun that melts the ice is the same sun that hardens the clay. The same word that convicts the heart is the same word that calluses the heart. Because you'll begin to make excuses. And you'll begin to point your finger at everybody else. And you'll begin to go, yeah, Lord, but. And what you'll do is when the Spirit of God begins to get on you, you'll start giving out your spiritual resume and all the stuff that you've done and how come, you, how come God must have been talking to somebody else because he was mistakenly, because you're such a good individual that God has to let you into heaven. Amen? Praise the Lord. So the preaching that they heard, Number two, y'all remember in the book of Acts, the Bible says that they stood and the Bible says that they were cut to the heart. 
See, before the Word of God can heal you, it's got to wound you. It's got to cut you. And before the Word of God can bring you alive, it's got to kill you. Number two, once you see the practicing that they did, the preaching that they heard, the practicing that they did. When they heard the Word of God, it caused them to go to action. It caused them to be obedient. It's amazing to me, and I'm not just talking about here, man. God allows me to go to other churches and preach, and people will come up, and they'll go, Brother, I enjoyed the message. And then they come back the next night and didn't do one thing that I I had preached the the night before. They didn't apply any of it. You know, you go preach a revival, and you talk about folks in their family that's lost and going to hell, and they won't bring none of them back the next night. They'll amen you out the building, but they won't go and share the gospel. Watch the practicing that they did. Look at verse 2. So Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Josedak, rose up and began to build the house of God. They heard the word of God, and the leaders got up and began to obey. Are 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 y'all getting it? They practiced by going back to work. They repented. They said, I consider my ways. I'm returning to the Lord. I'm getting back to the basics of what God's called me to be. Notice, listen to me. When you truly hear the word of God, you will obey and work. Now, we don't get to heaven by works, and we don't work to get to heaven. But I'm going to tell you what, if heaven's ever been deposited in you, you'll do something. Amen? You ever grabbed a hold of an electric fence? I guarantee you, if you rub up against an electric fence... You'll do something. You'll dance. You probably will say your Sunday school lesson backwards in German. Amen. For some of y'all, you just flat out, flat out cuss. Amen. Listen, when you hear the word of God, it either hardens you or humbles you, and it motivates you to begin to carry out and be obedient to what he is inside of you if you're saved. If you're not, if you're just religious, you're going to begin to go back to doing your job, and your job will, listen to me, never be a a joy to you. Your ministry will never be a ministry. It'll be misery. And you'll walk around with a sour look on your face, and nobody wants to be around you. And then you wonder why you don't fit in, and then there's cliques all over the church. The truth of the matter is everybody else sees your bitterness. Those that are bitter don't understand that they're bitter. Is that what we talked about four weeks ago in prayer meeting? That'll help you. Amen? Watch this. I want you to see what happens in verse 2. All, listen to me, all the people went back to work. Not the 10% doing the 100%. All the people went back to work. They all said, you know what? God, I'm an idiot. God, I'm ignorant. God, I'm lazy. We've been waiting for 14 years. Haggai and Zechariah get up. They preach the gospel. And all the people go back to work. Look at verse 2. So Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Yeshua, the son of Josedak, rose up and began to build the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. And the prophets of God were with them, helping them. Now, I want you to see this. You ready? Say amen. All the people, starting with the princes. Y'all understand that Zerubbabel was the governor. The prophets. The priest and the people came together and said, you know what, God, we have sinned. I see a lot of Second Chronicles 714 floating around. But what we want to do is we want everybody else to repent and us to be okay. What we want to do is blame everybody else and not ourselves. We want to blame Democrats and Republicans. We want to bring our mo- blame our mom and dad or our bosses or those crazy people we work with, and we don't ever want to look in the mirror. What did they do? They obeyed and went back to work. Here's, a, here's what happened. The leaders started, and the others followed. Dad, you want revival in your house? Maybe you need to lead them to the altar. Did you hear me? Well, my husband don't come to church. Mom, grandmama, maybe you need to start and lead and lead them to the altar. See, when the leaders started building, the rest of them followed. Are you listening? See, if revival is going to take place, it's got to start with the heads. You say, Brother Brandon, it needs to start with you. You doggone right it does. 
But it also starts with deacons and Sunday school teachers. It starts with daddies of their own house because the truth of the matter is God doesn't revive the church. He revives the home. And when the home gets revived in the church because we live in the home a whole lot longer than we live in the church. Is anybody listening? Let me tell you what happens though. When daddies start to lead or mamas start to lead, you got a bunch of kids that are a bunch of junkyard dogs. They want it their way. They don't want to follow. Don't tell me what to do. I'm my own man, really. Well, you start paying the phone bill. You start paying the electrical bill. You start paying the water bill. You start buying. Uh, is anybody listening to what I'm saying? See, our problem is, is we raised a bunch of selfish individual whiners. And let me help you. Before we start pointing at teenagers, it starts at 45 and works down. Mm-hmm. Can anybody say an amen in here? Here's what Vance Habner says. Y'all ready? This is one of the greatest statements I've ever heard him make. Here's a quote. Y'all ready? Daddy, we're going to start with you. When the Lord's sheep are dirty and gray, all black sheep are more comfortable. I'm going to pause and let that sink in. Because what we do in our families, we don't want anybody to be the black sheep. So what we do is we just let everything be gray. And when leaders are gray, the black sheep are comfortable. Sunday school teacher, if you're only going to come Sunday morning only, don't expect your folks to come to Sunday school be here any other time. Mom and dad, grandmom and granddaddy, I want you to hear what I'm about to say. The statistic has gone up now. Since 2015, it used to be 68%. Now it's 81%. 81% of kids that's going to graduate this year will never return back to church. You say, why is that happening? I'll tell you why. Because in just a few short weeks, um, amid a coronavirus that keeps people sitting at the house, the fair is going to roll into town. And little Johnny is going to go with a daddy to the monster truck race or the derby. And what he's going to see daddy do is he's going to pull a $100 bill out and break that $100 and spend that whole $100. And when it comes time for church on Sunday morning, when he, if he comes two times a month like most men do, he's going to see that same man who spent $100 at the fair put a $5 bill in the plate. And little Johnny's going to grow up understanding that the fair is worth more money than the church. And little Johnny's going to grow up understanding that you only got a gun two times a year. And it doesn't matter if you don't come Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. And then we wonder why kids would rather play travel ball. The majority of that's because mom and daddy's trying to live their life through them. Listen, you're old. Put the bat down. You're going to strike out. Can I get a witness in the house? When the Lord's sheep are dirty and gray, everybody else begins to feel comfortable among us. When's the last time you took a stand? Huh? When was the last time somebody felt uncomfortable because God was living through you? So the practice they did, it was all the people. I want you to watch this, though. According to Haggai, chapter 1, verse 12, I want you to see... It was not only all the people, but it was all his power. Look at, look, look at what happens. Haggai chapter 1, verse 12. It says, Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the, and Joshua, the son of Josedach, the high priest, watch this, with the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the presence of the Lord. In other words, when you look at what Haggai preached and they begin to hear and they begin to obey, they feared the presence of the Lord. And this doesn't mean that they were afraid. Listen, it doesn't mean that they were afraid to get in the presence. What it means is, is they repented and they were afraid to ever get out of the presence. Are you really concerned of whether or not God's on your life? Exodus 33, 12 through 16, I believe is one of the greatest statements Moses ever made. You say, well, Brother Brad, what about the Ten Commandments? Well, God made those. <laughs> Let's look at what Exodus 12, or Exodus 33, verse 12 through 16 says. Then Moses said to the Lord, 
Now, God's called Moses, put a call on his life, told him to lead the people out. Listen to what Moses says. See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name. Praise God. He knows us by name. And you have also found grace in my sight. Watch verse 13. Now, therefore, I pray, Moses says, if I found grace in your sight, show me now your way that I may know you. Watch this. That I may know you, not just your way, that I may know you and that I may find grace in your sight and consider that this nation is your people. Watch what he says in verse 14. And God says... My presence will go with you and will give you rest. It'll give you peace. It'll let you have a consolation of knowing that you're walking with the Lord and the Lord's walking in you. Watch verse 15. Here's what Moses says. Would to God, but if we don't hear anything else, we hear this right here. Here's what verse 15 says. Then Moses said to him, if your presence doesn't go with us, then don't you bring us up from here. See, our problem in America is we go and ask God to join us. Here's what Moses says, God, if you're not going to go with me, then don't you let me leave. Don't let me get out of your presence. For how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight except you go with us? So we shall be separate, your people and I, from all the people who are upon the face of the earth. See, if you don't separate yourself and sanctify yourself, all the gray matter and all the black sheep become comfortable. I want to ask you a question. Do you ever give a thought of whether or not God's going with you? Do you care? And the people feared the presence of the Lord. That's what Haggai 1 says, verse 12. They said, Lord, we don't want to go back to Babylon. Lord, we don't want to go back to shambles. Listen, we're, we're in the process of building this temple, and the reason we're having to build the temple is because we wouldn't repent. Our fathers, our grandfathers, just lackadaisical, just went by. They would hear the preaching of the prophet, but they wouldn't obey. And would to God, 40 years from now, after me and you are dead and gone, that there's somebody that can walk in this, in this place or whatever other building and say, they stuck with the stuff. What did they do? Let's look at it. First of all, they recognized his presence. Haggai chapter 1, verse 12. Ezra chapter 5, verse 11, they remembered the promise of God. Look at what verse 11 of chapter 5 says. And thus they returned us an answer. This is the people, Tathaniah has asked the question, and here's what they said. Here's how they identified themselves. When they were questioned of who and why they were building, here's what they said. We are the servants of the God of heaven and earth, and we are rebuilding the temple that was built many years ago. They remembered. Are you listening? They remembered the promise which a great king of Israel built and completed, talking about Solomon. You got me? Do you remember the good old days? Do you remember where we could have revival in, for two weeks and it would grow, not fade off? Do you remember where you could come and get in the presence of the Lord and you didn't want to leave? Do you, do you remember when you could open your Bible and God would speak to you directly? Do you remember the day and age in which in your personal walk with Jesus, you didn't fear what anybody else said? Recognize his presence. Remember the promise. Third thing, is they repented of the past. Look at verse 12. But because our fathers provoked the God of heaven to wrath, he gave them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the Chaldean, who destroyed this temple and carried the people away to Babylon. Do you understand that there's a lot of folks in this congregation that reported this that the only life they knew was Babylon. They were born in Babylon. See, the truth of the matter is this. We don't have a problem repenting from the past, especially when it, we can blame our forefathers. Most of us in this room, our major deal is, is we don't know how to repent 
in the present. Because what we're doing is allowing our past to keep us from doing what we're supposed to be doing in the present. Stuff like this. Well, Brother Brad, that's just who I am. No, no, no. If, if, if you're born again, that ain't who you are. You're no longer, you, don't, you no longer exist. Well, you just don't know, man. My mom and daddy, I don't care. Listen, verse, ver, to have verse 12, you got to have verse 11. You got to remember the promise. You got to recognize the presence. Consider your ways. Return to me and repent of the past. Here's what they did. They quit finger pointing. They said, because our fathers did it, we're having to do this. They weren't griping and complaining. They said, we are where we are because we've done what we've done. Amen? They recognized the presence. They remembered the promise. They repented from the past. Verse 13 through 16, listen to me. And they recalled the plan. Here's what it says in verse 13. However, in the first year of King Cyrus, king of Babylon, King Cyrus issued a decree to build this, this house of God. Also, the gold and silver articles of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple that was in Jerusalem and carried into the temple of Babylon, those King Cyrus took from the temple of Babylon, and they were given to one named Sheshbazzar, whom he had made governor. And he said to him, take these articles, go carry them to the temple, temple site that it is in Jerusalem and let the house of God be rebuilt on its former site. Watch verse 16. Then the same Sheshbazzar came and laid the foundation of the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. But from what time, listen, from that time, even until now, it's been under construction and it's not finished. And for such a time as this, we have been chosen by God to finish the task. Yes, we could sit here and curse the darkness all day long, but get up and do something. I, I love it when people go, well, Brother Brad, we're going to go over here, you know, because they got ministry. Uh, they got this ministry. Have you ever t started trying to start the ministry here? I mean, if you really desired it. See, now the truth of it is, is they don't want to be a part of the ministry. They want to be ministered to. Is anybody in this house listening to anything I'm saying? Well, we get, you know, that church down the road, man, they got this ministry. We're going to go down there. What, have, you ever, have you ever done that ministry? No, because we desire to get something out of it instead of coming and bringing sacrifices. So they recalled the plan. Here's what they said. Hey, 14 years ago, as a matter of fact, it's now been 20 years ago, there was a decree went out from Cyrus. And now here we are. Because we've sat and let 14 years slide by. We're not going to stop the work. Who, who, who gave you the authority? Who gave you the right to do this? We're going to talk about that in just a second. They understood the plan of God. Amen? Number three, I want you to see not only the, practicing that they, uh, the preaching that they heard, the practicing that they did. Number three, I want you to see the provisions they needed. Do you understand God provided every bit of it? Ezra chapter 6, flip over to Ezra chapter 6, verse 8 through 10. Here's what it says. This is the decree of Darius. After they've written this letter, they've sent it to Darius and said, listen, we want you to understand what's going on down here in Jerusalem. So Darius writes back. Now watch what he says, starting in verse 16. I'm sorry, starting in verse 8. Moreover, I issue a decree as to what you should do for the elders of these Jews for the building of this house of God. Let the cost be paid at the king's expense from the taxes on the region beyond the river. This is to be given immediately to these men so that they are not hindered. In other words, let's expedite this thing. And whatever they need, young bulls, rams, and lambs, and for the burnt offerings of the God of heaven, wheat, salt, wine, and oil, according to the request of the priests who are in Jerusalem, let it be given them day by day without fail, that they may offer sacrifices of sweet aroma to the God of heaven and pray for the life of the king and his son. Let me tell you what happened, guys. When some folks begin to repent and get back to work, you know what the king said? The king says, hey, leave them, leave them alone. Maybe they'll pray for me. Instead of griping about Democrats and Republicans, why don't we do what the Bible says and pray for all men, especially those in authority and kings? Amen. 
Do you understand that these men first showed up on the scene to hinder them? And then the king comes back and goes, no, you're going to give them everything they need and stay away from them. Don't you hinder them. Give them what they need. Boy, ain't that the way God works? Quit worrying about your accusers. Quit worrying about the opponents. Just repent, return to God, and watch God do what only God can do. They had a mandate from the king, amen? Who told you you could do this? Well, the king did. As a matter of fact, it started with Cyrus, and now it's Darius. Oh, really? Yeah. So go back and talk to Darius. Write a letter to him. See what he says. And before they could get answered, they, I mean, they was really wanting to shut the thing down. And Darius goes, look, stay far from them. That's what the text says. Stay away from them. Amen? Now I want you to see this. They got materials from the king and they got a mandate from the king. Y'all ready? Are you ready? Say aha. Uh -huh. I want you to look at verse 5 of chapter 5. Here's what's important. is the protection that they enjoyed. And the eye of their God was upon them. Now many of us run around talking about we're more than conquerors and we're all this and if God be for us, who can be against us? Well, here's the question I've got to ask you. Do you understand if you don't repent, God's against you. You're going to have holes in your bag. You're going to work like a dog and not make ends meet. You're going you're gonna to pursue everything in this world and never enjoy life. Here's what it says in verse 5. But the eye of their God was upon the elders of the Jews so that they could not make them cease Till a report could go to Darius, then a written answer was returned concerning this matter. Are, are you listening? If God be for you, who can be against you? You go, well, Brother Brad, God's for everybody. Really? Here's what God says. God says those who love the world is an enemy of God. If you're a friend of the world, you're an enemy. Of, that's what the Bible says. If you love the world more than you love Jesus, you are an adversary. You're an adulterer, an adulteress. Amen. What is the protection? Look at chapter 6, verse 6 through 8. Now therefore, Tethani, governor of the region beyond the river, and she Shethar, Bosni, and your companions, the Persians who are beyond the river, keep yourselves far from there. Here's what the king said. Stay away from them. A pagan king. Verse 7. Let the work of this house of God alone, let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews build this house of God on its site. Moreover, I issue a decree as to what you should do for the elders. We've already talked about that. Here's what he says. Stay away from them, but give them everything they need. The pagan governor, because he saw something different in a repented people, would to God they would see more than a rebellious people just saying bless the Lamb of God I'm going to do whatever I want to do because it's my God given right but they'd find some folks repenting they'd find some folks that would be praying they'd find folks that would, be, that would stop cursing the darkness and making our political opinions known and just begin to fall on our faces and say God we have sinned the United States of America is in the shambles it's in because the house of God is in the shambles that it's in. And for 60 to 70 years, we've turned a blind eye to it and let garbage just keep piling up and blaming everybody else and blaming the young folks and blaming the older folks and blaming these folks and blaming that folk. I want you to understand, we must haul garbage off. Got to look in the mirror and say, God, it's me. If we're ever going to have revival, if we're ever going to experience the presence of God, it's going to come by the preaching of the Word. It's going to come by the practicing of the Word and obeying the Word. It's going to move by us allowing Jesus Christ to be Jesus on the inside of us, and God's going to provide everything we need, and in that, He's going to protect us because the eye of God will then be on us. Amen. 
give you some points about this. Y'all ready? I got fired up a little bit right there. What did they enjoy? Here they, here's what they enjoyed. They enjoyed separation from the opponent or the opposition. I tell you what, man, I wish political people would ask me before it was a campaign season. You know what I mean? When it comes to campaign season, they want the preacher to come down there and pray for them. Why don't you show up any other time? Hmm? Is anybody listening to anything I'm saying? It's amazing to me how when people run for office, they start showing up for church. They ain't been in church in a month of Sundays. Mm hmm. And then we're going to grassroot it. He told them to stay far from there. Amen. We're separated from the opponent. Not only did they enjoy being separated from the opponent, listen, they enjoyed being secured from the objecting. They, don't hinder them. Quit standing down there talking about them. Y'all remember when we, we, in the next 80 years, it's going to continue. The accusations are going to be going on. We get to Nehemiah. They're going, well, even if they built the wall, if a fox run over, the thing would fall down. You know them stinking Jews don't know how to build. They were secure from the objective, objection. Watch this. According to verse 11, they had a religious right. Are you listening to me? Chapter 5, verse 11 says, And thus they returned us an answer, saying, We are the servants of the God of heaven and earth. Here's what's amazing. If this would have happened in 2020, they'd have told them their name. I'll tell you who I am. Notice they said we're the servants. They, they weren't about making their name famous. They was about serving the Lord. They, you're going to know who I am. That's what 2020 says. Hey, make a splash. YOLO. Come on now. You only got one life to live. Make it count. Really? They had a religious right with the servants of God of heaven and earth. But not only did they have a religious right, they had a legal right. Look at verse 13. However, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Babylon, King Cyrus issued a decree. Look at verse 1 of chapter 6. Then King Darius issued a decree. You know what they did? Here's what they said. When they came, they said, listen, we're here because Cyrus gave us the right to come. Now, if you don't mind, go back to Darius and y'all go start doing a little research inside the Capitol building and find the Constitution. Y'all need to sit up and pay attention when I'm fixing to make an application right here. Find the Constitution and understand that the first king gave us a decree. And then Darius says, he goes and he finds it and he tells them, listen, let me add to it. Not only did he give them a decree, you boys are going to protect them and take care of them. What to God. Some of y'all would have paid attention in civics class, and y'all younger bunch don't even know what civics is because we quit teaching it. So now we think that an executive order holds more power than the law, and I want you to understand one man in the United States of America, I don't care if he's a Democrat or Republican, I don't care if he's the president, governor, or mayor, can override the Constitution of the United States of America. What he says is not law. It's called legislation branch. Man, we need to get back to Channel 10. I know it's Channel 8 up here, Bobby, but in, our, in Alabama, it's Channel 10. Amen? We need to learn that song on how to make a bill. Anybody remember that? Remember that dude walking around on the steps of the White House? Schoolhouse Rock. Amen? Come on, Bobby, work with me. And then Yuck Mouth came on right after that, right? They called me Yuck Mouth because I don't brush. I like my teeth like this. Come on. Anyway. Uh, listen to me. We... Run by the word of God. We're blessed to live in a country that has a constitution. We don't look to the constitution first. We look to the word of God first. Amen. And only. Right. Do you hear me? Is anybody? Mm-mm-mm. Mm-mm-mm. So the protection they enjoyed, let me give you the last point and we're going to Shut her down. Amen. I want you to look at the, prosper, the prospering they obtained. Look at verse 8. Chapter 5, verse 8. 
Here's what Tethanai said. Let it be known to the king that we went into the province of Judea, of Judea to the temple of the great God, which is being built with heavy stone and timber, is being laid in, in the walls, and this work goes on diligently and prospers in their hand. Ezra chapter 6, verse 14. So the elders of the Jews built and they prospered through the prophesying, watch this, through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Idu, and they built and finished it according to the commandment of God of Israel and according to the command of Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. It took them three kingdoms and kings to finally get something that they could have got done in four years. You're going to miss it. If you would just go ahead and repent, you're going to save yourself some heartache and years. If we as a church would just repent, not just individuals as a church, would just repent, God will restore the years the locusts have eaten. Here's what it says. The work goes on. Let me give you two points under that. Ready? First of all, the work was constant. This isn't in my notes up there. The work was constant. Look at the word diligently. They work diligently. It means they're consistently, constantly working. See, some of us, we're so inconsistent, don't nobody know where to find you on Sunday. See, some of us are so inconsistent, what it basically means is our testimony is, well, it's according to thing, got anything else to do, then we'll check at the church. If we ain't going to the river or to the beach, or to Tunica. The only time some of y'all are Choctaw Indians is when you got to go gamble. <laughs> Amen. The work was constant. Number two, the work was concluded. I want to ask you a question. Do you see a lot of unfinished things? What are you doing about getting it done? What are you going to... I mean, it's just going to keep laying unfinished for 20 years until somebody repents and goes, you know what, God? It's our fault. Ezra chapter 6, verse 14 says, and they finished it. Is that not what it says? Brother Kyle, is that not what it says? They prospered through the prophesying, through the preaching of Zechariah and through the preaching of Haggai. You know what they did? They didn't come and bite the bit. They came and said, preacher, what you're saying is me. You're exactly right. I repent. I'm returning back to work. I'm going to obey the Spirit of God. And listen to me, four pagan kings get to see what God does in the midst of the most detrimental time in the lives of the Jews. Seventy years they've been in Babylonian captivity. Jeremiah 29, 11, I've got plans to prosper you. Some of that's y'all's life verse. Read those verses before that. Are y'all ready to spend 70 years in that before you get to 29, 11? Then you got 12 and 13. Can I get an Amen. The work was concluded. Watch this, and I'm, we're bringing her down. Worship was commenced. Worship finally began. You find that in Ezra chapter 6, verse 16 through 22. I want us to read it, okay? Don't you see what happens? When they finally get the temple built. Now, remember, they had to build the altar first. Then they built the temple around the altar. They had to put it back on its site. They had to go by the blueprint. Amen? So we've been building, going somewhere over the last five weeks. Now watch. Then the children of Israel, the priests and the Levites, and the rest of the descendants of the captivity, that means everybody, celebrated the dedication of the house of God with joy. You know what? Here's what, man, they were excited. Listen, for some of those young folks, they had never seen the previous temple. For the older folks, they just sit and wept and said, you know what, I never thought that I'd ever see this happen. There's some folks sitting in this room that never thought Christ Life Academy would ever get to happen. Amen? But the Lord's doing what only the Lord can do. Amongst a bunch of Gideon, listen, Gideon, Gideon's little band of ignorant folks that don't know much. Starting with the preacher. Don't look at me like y'all all spiritual. What's this. Here's what they did. And they offered sacrifices at the dedication of this house. The house of God, 100 bulls. Y'all tally this up. 
200 rams, 400 lambs, and as a sin offering for all Israel, 12 milk goats, according to the number of the, tri of the tribes of Israel. Here's what they did. They assigned the priests to their division. Hey, boys, let's get back to work. Not only do we got to take care of the landscaping in the building, but let's, let's get back to worship. To the Levites to their division over the service of God in Jerusalem as it was written, watch this, in the book of Moses. They did it according to what Scripture says. They didn't do it because they thought it was just time to go do it. They found their place according to Scripture and they stayed in their place. And the descendants of the captivity, watch this, they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the first month. For the priests and the Levites had purified themselves. It's been quite some time. Them boys done anything. All of them were ritually clean. All of them. What did God everybody? Are y'all listening? They slaughtered the Passover lambs for all the descendants of the captivity, for their brethren, the priests, and for themselves. Let me tell you what that says. What that, go back. Let me tell you what that says. This is what it says. They not only sacrificed for the people that came with them, they sacrificed for the people that stayed in Babylon. They slaughtered the Passover lambs for all the descendants of the captivity, for their brethren, the priests, and for themselves. Here's what it would do. The, the head of the house, the daddy went for the first time in 70 years. They now have an altar built. They now have a temple built. And here's what dad said. Hey, here's my lamb, not only for the folks that came with me, but I got some wayward kids. They're still eating out of the pots of Babylon. And I'm going to do everything I need to do to stay on the altar. And I'm going to keep bringing sacrifices. And I'm going to simply wait and watch God. You ready? For some of them, it took another 40 years before they got back to, back to Jerusalem. Some of them came with Esther. Some of them came with Jeremiah. Some of them came with Ezra. But it took a total of 80 years to get everybody out of Babylon. I want to ask you a question. If they were in bondage for 70 years and it took them 80 years to get out of it, how long do you think we're going to have to deal with this mess that we're in today to get out of it? Is anybody listening to anything I'm saying? Then the children of Israel who had returned from the captivity ate together. Watch this. They ate together. What did they eat? They ate the Passover lamb. Why? Because Exodus 12 says you had to decide on a lamb. You had to go find one that fit the ramifications and the recommendations and the qualifications. They had to kill that lamb. They had to take the blood, put it on the doorpost and the lintel, right? So they had to decide on a lamb. They had to depend on a lamb. Then they dined on the lamb. They celebrated it. They ate the lamb. Then the children of Israel who had returned to captivity ate together, watch this, with all who had separated themselves from the filth. Do y'all hear that? From the filth of the nation. Some of us have been laying with the world so long that we don't even smell like Jesus anymore. From the filth of the nations of the land in order to seek the Lord God of Israel. Let me just tell you, some of us would rather flip through our phone and look at Facebook on Sunday morning sermons than to sit and listen. Some of us would rather look at it on the phone than bring a copy of God's Word and find the books of the Bible. You go, Brother Brad, I don't know the books of the Bible. Whose fault is that? Get in it. Open it up. Let it be something more than what you do on Sunday morning. And they kept the Feast of Unleavened Bread seven days with joy. Would to God folks would show up with joy, Brother Mike. Would to God that sign up and pay for the men's conference. Would to God that sign up and get back to women's ministry instead of dropping out. Would to God that have joy and sing in the choir. Would to God could we find enough people to keep the, the video and the sound equipment done. Would to God that serve in the nursery with joy. Would to God would they come with anticipation every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night that God was going to keep his eye on us. Or are we just going to punch in and punch out, go to the brass lantern, and I'll catch you at the pheasant fry tonight. Let me just go ahead and clear the, clear the platform right here. If you don't like pheasant, I don't care. Come fellowship. Yeah. I'm sick and tired of Baptist going, I don't like what's on the menu, so I'm going to sit at the house. Yeah, come on, yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Do you understand we do what we do not to feed your belly, but to allow you to have fellowship with some folks that you ain't fellowship with in 17 weeks? Watch this. 
for the Lord, Brother Kyle, the Lord made them joyful. You could fake your joy all day long. If God hadn't given it to you, I can tell. Well, Brother Kyle, I tell you, man, it's good to say you in the house of the Lord today. You know, I've been to some churches that sing sweet, sweet spirit, and it's really a sour spirit. Can I get an amen? There's a sweet, sweet spirit. Don't nobody want to hear that junk? You say the joy of the Lord's your strength? Really? Return to me the joy of thy salvation? Really? I'm telling you right now. I I'm telling you. If y'all could stand up here and watch y'all come through that door late and the looks on y'all's faces. Coming into the presence of Jehovah Jireh, God my provider. Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Nisi, God Almighty, El Shaddai, Adonai. We're coming into the presence of God and we're dragging our stinking knuckles. God, I'm here, bless me. And God made them joyful. Watch this. And he turned their, the heart of the king of Assyria toward them. And he strengthened their hands. And the work of the house of God the God of Israel. See, the reason we're running on fumes is because we don't have joy. It's a job. Well, ain't nobody else going to do it. I guess I'm going to have to do it. Mm, 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 mm. I got a lot to say about that, but I'm going to go ahead and shut her down. What is the conclusion? Here's the conclusion. Y'all ready? Say amen. Put it up there, Mark. Let them see it. The Lord gave them a word, caused them to work, provided what they needed, protected them as his eyes stayed on them, strengthened their hands in the work, allowed them to see the completion of the work, and commenced of worship, started again. All because they heard the word, received the word, and repented. They considered their ways. They quit blaming everybody else. Amen? They took full responsibility of their spiritual condition. They quit blaming the preacher. They quit blaming their spouse. They quit blaming their kids. They quit blaming whatever event happened in their life that caused them to be mad at God. They stopped that garbage and said, you know what, God? I'm the problem. I'll give you two questions and we're done. Here it is. When was the last time you had a word and obeyed it? When was the last time you heard, well done, you had finished When's the last time? If not, why not? You know, the truth of the matter is, Brother Kyle prayed just a few moments ago that we'd be a conduit. True story. Now I'm done. True story. We got to go to Zimbabwe. The first time I went to Africa, I went to Zimbabwe. We got out in the bush. Me and Drexel got to go to a fish camp. And in the fish camp, there was no homes. There was just like, there weren't even huts. There was just thatched roofs and a little bit of plastic, if they could find plastic or whatever, washed up. You got me? Drexel was going to teach Sunday school, share his testimony. I was going to preach. We get there and we're looking around. And uh, guys, I'm telling you, you'd have to fall out of a helicopter to get there. I mean, that, you, that, I'm telling you, it's in, the, it's in the uttermost parts of the world. I'm talking about people in Zimbabwe didn't even know those people were there. So Drexel got up, shared his testimonies, taught Sunday school. In between Sunday school and the preaching time, they took about a 20-minute fellowship time where you ate a crumpet and drank some coffee. If you like strong coffee, go to Africa. Because they get it in cups about this big, and I said, hmm. They must be rationing this. No, I know why. Because you drank that, you won't sleep for three days. And so the, the, the head of the tribe, the, the king of the tribe, came and was talking, whatever they were talking in, to my translator. And my translator just takes off running through the woods. And I'm like, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Well, there's only two dudes here that don't look like anybody else. And we don't understand what they're saying. You understand? You need to come back over here. He said, no, no, no. He said, we got to go down here because something's cut the water supply off. 
And all these people need water. Many of them's going to be walking 10 miles to get here for preaching. And so what they had done is they had bamboo sticks, is what I called it, that had hollowed it out, and that was their plumbing. And it was on a gravity flow, and they just stuck the end of it in a, in a lake. Y'all got me? They didn't have a generator. They didn't have a pump to pump it, okay? It was on gravity flow. And so they all take off around. I looked at Drexel and said, I ain't staying here. Let's go within. So we go down to the end of this bamboo's winding up, up the hill. Y'all got me? We get there. There's leaves. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at Drexel like, don't drink the water. But they wanted the water. There's stuff everywhere. And I was like, well, it's got to be, you know, probably something stopped up. So they cleaned all the leaves out. And they would holler, got water yet? No. So we began to take the bamboo apart. And in the third section of the bamboo, not the first, not the second, but in the third section of the bamboo, a tadpole had swam up and grew into a frog and has stopped the water flow. Why am I giving you this illustration? Because it ain't the first stick, it ain't the second stick. Somewhere in your life, way down the line, you let something as small that you thought of sin, of a tadpole, slide up, and now the root of bitterness and jealousy, and anger, or whatever the case may be, laziness, self-centeredness, has grown into a full-size frog. Listen to me. That has stopped the gravity flow of the Spirit of God in your life. And today, the invitation is, you need to start dismantling your channel, the conduit. And start killing frogs. If we're ever going to have revival and we're ever going to get back to work, we got to hear a word and we got to obey it completely. It wasn't fun standing in knee deep water, not knowing what was swimming in the water. But I'm going to tell you. When we got the frog out of it and we hooked it back together, down in the, in the end of that pipe in the village, there was cheering when water began to flow. And I wonder today in this Gideon's band, if we would just simply begin to kill frogs, if Lawrence County and Giles County won't have some cheering, because what stopped the move of God started in our lives many years ago. And today, we are going to obey. We're going to consider our ways. We're going to return to him. And we're going to kill the frogs. For some of y'all, it's still in the tadpole phase. For some of y'all, it's still gotten a little bigger. And for some of y'all, it's full grown. And for most of us in this room, starting with the preacher on down, there's more than one for all. So if we would simply repent, God will do the reviving, cause us to have joy, and the flow of water the Spirit of God will strengthen our hands and we won't have to be asked. The joy of the Lord will flow from heaven and the pagans will cheer because of who God is. Let's pray. Lord, all over the building.